Chemistry is the study of matter and its changes, so it's important for us to be able to keep track of that matter while it's undergoing the changes that we call chemical reactions. The way we typically do that is with chemical equations. The foundation for chemical equations and the way we write them is uh, conservation of mass. Conservation of mass. Uh, this is a law in the science uh, sense um, that tells us that during any physical or chemical change, the total mass of the products has to be equal to the total mass of the reaction of the reactants. We can't just magically have mass appear or disappear in a chemical reaction. Now, we're going to be using some of these terms quite a bit. Um, just as a little review, what is a law when we're talking about the scientific process of inquiry? A law is a reliable prediction that's been based on many repeated measurements or observations. So a law is something that we can be fairly confident in using to predict future action. So uh, the law of gravity, if I have something that has mass and I let it go, it's going to fall down, right? As long as I'm on Earth and experience of gravity. It's not magically going to fall up or fall sideways unless there's a really strong wind. Um, so a law is something that is just a, a formal statement of an observation that has been found to be reliable uh, over time and over repeated measurements or experiments. So uh, we usually start to formally call this the law of conservation of mass, but this often is also referred to as the law of conservation of matter, because what is matter? Well, it's something that occupies space and has mass. So how do we get the law of conservation of matter into what we call a chemical equation? So a chemical equation is a symbolic representation of a chemical or sometimes a physical change. <clears throat> so if we've got the sentence in words, hydrogen gas reacts with oxygen gas to form gaseous water, how do we symbolically translate that into a chemical equation? So here we've got hydrogen gas. Remember, hydrogen is one of those diatomic elements and gas, so G, <coughs> reacts with plus oxygen gas, O2, that's another one of our diatomics, gas, so the G, to form gaseous water, H2O, G, gas. The left side of this <coughs> excuse me, the left side of this equation is called the reactants because that's what's reacting, and the right side is the products. So again, we've got this relationship, but we need that relationship to follow the law of conservation of matter. We end up doing that with a little bit of <coughs> what I call atomic accounting. So uh, H2 plus O2 gas gives us H2O gas. Um, as this is written right now, let's do some atomic accounting. Let's just go through and count up um, how many of each type of atom there is on both sides. So I like to make a little table. Um, hydrogens, I've got two hydrogens on the left. They're combined as one H2 molecule. And I've got two hydrogens on the right coming out <coughs> as part of my H2O gas. Um, so two go in, two go out, we're in good shape. What about oxygen? I've got two oxygen atoms as part of an O2 molecule, and uh, I've only got one oxygen coming out. So I've got two going in and one going out. I haven't conserved matter. It, as written, I have an oxygen that's magically disappearing in this process, and that's not allowed. So we have to balance this chemical equation in order to observe or in order to be consistent with the law of conservation of matter. So let's take a look here. Um, again, these are diatomics. Oxygen is coming in two at a time, so if water is only one oxygen, that seems like we probably need two waters. So what if I just put a two in front of water? Well now, let's check our accounting table again. My oxygens, I've got two going in, two coming out, but 
hydrogens, there are two going in and now four coming up because there are two water molecules. Each water molecule has two hydrogens, so that's a total of four hydrogens. Um, so I fixed the oxygen, but I made a, made a problem with the hydrogen accounting. But hydrogen is all coming in together, so let's just try a two in front of that. That gives me four hydrogens going in, four hydrogens coming out, two oxygens going in, two oxygens coming out, and we've got a balanced chemical equation. My, my atomic accounting ends up working out for us. Um, now this type of process you're going to see over and over again when you balance chemical equations. Uh, You'll identify a problem with the equation not being balanced, and you might fix one thing, but that ends up breaking something else um, that you then have to go in and fix. So this is an iterative process. We have to do the steps multiple times in order to get to a good final answer. When we're balancing chemical equations, uh, a few things to kind of help us out, a few things uh, to get us started. First of all, we have to start with balanced chemical formulas because if we don't have balanced chemical formulas, we're never going to have a balanced chemical reaction, balanced chemical equation. So always pay attention to the formulas and get those chemical formulas balanced properly. Um, another thing to, to help us out a little bit is look for relationships that aren't one to one. So if, as we saw in that last example, uh, diatomic elements are always coming in in pairs. So if we don't have an even number of diatomic element of the diatomic element on the product side or on the other side of the equation, uh, we're probably going to have to do some adjusting. There. Um, also, if we've got you know when we have ionic and covalent formulas with multiple elements, especially if they don't have a nice even one-to-one -one balance, uh, that's something that often is going to lead us to have to take some steps to get that balance. When we're working with polyatomic ions, for the majority of reactions, polyatomic ions stay the same polyatomic ion. So if it's on the reactant side and it goes to the product side, an awful lot of the time that doesn't change. So if phosphate goes in, phosphate comes out. You can treat that as one unit. Um, if that makes it a little bit easier, rather than breaking it apart and looking specifically at phosphorus and oxygen, because it doesn't break apart in the chemical process we're looking at. Always check that at, uh, that atomic accounting. Um, you know, it may seem like a little bit of extra work to put that table together, but oftentimes having that little table is really helpful to uh, help you think through the process and uh, definitely helps you catch some errors uh, in balancing as you move forward. The other thing is we should always try to use the, the lowest whole number ratio. So looking at that same reaction, if I do the atomic accounting, this is balanced with six hydrogens and three oxygens and six waters, but these aren't the smallest whole numbers that we can use to make that balance, right? Just like we saw, two, one, and two balance this equation. So um, in almost all situations, use the lowest whole number ratios that you can uh, to get the balanced equation. All right, let's take a look at a couple more examples just, just to get working through these. Uh, again, here is what's happening. Methane gas reacts with oxygen gas to form carbon dioxide gas and water. So translating that into a symbolic chemical equation, methane gas, CH4 is methane, G for gas, reacts with oxygen gas plus O2 gas, again diatomic, to form carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide gas, and water gas. So let's just take a look at our atomic accounting table. One carbon on the left side going in, one carbon on the right side going out, carbon is okay but hydrogen. What do we have? We've got four hydrogens going in and we only have two hydrogens coming out. What about oxygen? We have two oxygens going in and we've got three oxygens coming out. So hydrogen and oxygen are both 
causing a little bit of problems. If we look at hydrogen, and we start with hydrogen, well, four are going in, and we're using them up in pairs in water. So what if we just put a two in front of the, uh, the water? That gets us to four hydrogens. And that gets us what? That gives us two oxygens and two more. So a total of four oxygens going uh, coming out. Oxygen is coming in in pairs as diatomic molecules. So two oxygens going in. Our atomic accounting works, and we've got a balanced chemical equation here. So one goes in, one comes out, four go in, four go out, four go in, four go out. One more example. Um, sodium carbonate aqueous solution reacts with barium nitrate aqueous solution to form barium carbonate solid and sodium nitrate aqueous solution. So here are some of those uh, polyatomic ions. So let's just get it written in, um, in symbolic form. Sodium carbonate, remember carbonate is a negative two ion, so sodium should be plus one. So Na2CO3 AQ, aqueous solution, plus barium nitrate. So barium is in the second column of the periodic table. It should be plus two. Uh, nitrate is a minus one, so we need two nitrates for the balanced chemical formula. React to form barium carbonate, barium plus two, carbonate minus two, so barium carbonate solid. And sodium nitrate, sodium plus one, nitrate plus one, sodium nitrate uh, aqueous solution. Now you can see here, before we even get into the accounting, in this reaction, carbonate on the left side is still carbonate on the right side. Uh, nitrate is nitrate on the left, nitrate is nitrate on the right. So when we're doing polyatomics, we can actually do our atomic accounting by keeping those polyatomics together. So you know, this column is still labeled atom type, but we can keep the carbonate as carbonate and the nitrate as nitrate and work with it that way. So looking at our accounting table here, we've got two sodiums going in and only one sodium coming out. We've got one carbonate going in and one carbonate coming out. We've got one barium coming in and we've got one barium coming out and we've got two nitrates coming in and one nitrate coming out so sodium is in balance and nitrate is in balance fortunately those go together on the product side so if we just put a two in front of sodium nitrate now we've got two sodiums going in and two sodiums coming out Nitrate, we've got two nitrates going in, and now we've got two nitrates going out as well. So we've got our balanced chemical equation. What about those state labels? Uh, one of the things that uh, that often get kind of neglected, and, and at least early uh, when y'all are working with chemical equations, those state labels just seem like they're an extra thing. And, people just ignore them and, and drop them out. Um, in one sense, that's not horrible, but it's really good practice to just get in the habit of always putting state labels in because we're going to come across a number of situations where it's extremely important to know those state labels of all the reactants and products of the reactions we're looking at. So better to start now by always making that a deliberate habit when you're writing out a chemical equation just put the state label in as long as you have enough information to actually um, know what the state labels are so always put them in um, at worst you can ignore them at the end of the process uh, at best they'll help you figure out what's going on in some different reactions as with many things balanced chemical equations are something that becomes much more natural, much easier with repetition. So go out there and find lots of opportunities to practice, practice, practice uh, balancing chemical equations. And I'll see you again next time.